uh, after tonight, and then I think we'll be all done with the um, with the Old Testament. And uh, like I mentioned before, we'll take a break after that. And, um, really, a lot of a lot of this stuff I had to just not really mention because there's especially um, you know things are changing really yearly with with archaeology. Uh, we're finding a lot of new new things, um, a lot of exciting things, and then there's a lot of things that have been dug up that haven't been um, translated yet. There's a real shortage of translators. There's um, just a lot of information that hasn't been translated, and then of those that have been translated, they're still waiting to be published, and there's just a, a lot of of back work on archaeology. Um, so let's look a little bit at the prophets. The prophets, uh, the biblical prophets, are not a a um, singular event. The, what I mean by that is the prophets that um, God's prophets were, were by no means the only prophets. Um, nearly every culture has had uh, versions and, and variations of prophets. Um, for instance, in, in Greece, they had you know obviously the kind of demonic prophet thing going on there a very long history of that um, in fact if you if you saw the movie 300 they kind of uh, had a reference to her anyways um, so so it's not something that we should think that um, some parts of the Bible are like what am I trying to say sometimes when we read the Bible we think that everything in the Bible has no um, corresponding thing that happened in <laughs> secular world, secular religion, and that's just not true. Um, we, we looked at, for instance, the, the tabernacle that the Israelites built when they were in the wilderness and how that they were that, that structure of a tabernacle was, was in, 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 in use in the area. It wasn't something that they invented, per se. And uh, just because Israel wasn't the first to invent everything doesn't mean that um, you know the, the things of the Bible don't have purpose. Rather, it means they have even more purpose. Because God chose to use things that people actually knew. And people actually... Uh... So, okay. I think you get what I'm saying. So, the uh, the prophets that were not God's prophets, the secular prophets, the biggest distinction between God's prophets and them was that um, the prophets of the Bible, they focus more on morality. You, you don't really hear them just droning on about practicing... Um, uh, tradition. like You know what I mean? Like They, they don't go on and on about... Um, you didn't sacrifice two birds, but only one bird. You know, they, they don't, they more talk about like, what have I commanded you to do? Well, to, to love justice and to, and, 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 or, I'm sorry, to act with justice and to love mercy and all, you know, all these things. And Micah talks about that. Or I believe it's Malachi where he's talking about, you're, 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 you're sinning against me because you're not doing what I told you to do. My prophets are sinning against you because... You know, they're, they're, they're being false prophets. And then in Jeremiah, where he talks about, you know, the weeping prophet, all these things that are going on. So you see a lot of different things uh, in, in theme. The prophets are obviously concerned with with people um, obeying the law, but not for the sole purpose of, of tradition. I mean, for instance, Isaiah, who, who goes on and talks about, um, your sacrifices are an abomination to me. I don't desire them. They're, they're, they've gotten to be just annoying. I'm getting tired of them. You know, and, and then you, you contrast that with the secular prophets, and there's just a big distinction there. More, and, and, and the bigger the bigger picture here is that the prophets helped the people to understand that sir, that worship to God consisted of how you treated your neighbor, and that was another connection that the that the prophet that the secular prophets didn't make. Um, so they weren't really concerned with morality because morality wasn't necessarily an absolute; it was more of just like a uh, translucent thing, a grayish area. Um, and, and they they were more focused on you have angered the God because you haven't been faithful in your uh, in your sacrifices, that kind of stuff. So a big a really big issue there. Um, another thing is that uh, the the prophets um, the secular prophets they more went on signs and omen uh, they're called omens. So basically um, if a bird was seen at this time of year it means that this is going to happen. If there's a comet in the sky at this time of year, it means that this is going to happen. 
or they would look at the entrails of an animal, and, and then they would have. In fact, Babylon had a very extensive uh, record of how to read omens. I mean, just a really extensive thing. Anyways, uh, and the gods, pro gods, prophets didn't really do that. They more relied on direct uh, communication between themselves and God, to where God would say, "Hey, go and tell this people this," and then the prophets say, "Okay," and they go do that. Um, <clears throat> And so a, a big a, another big point there is prophets will always be validated or disproven by whether their prophecies come, come true or not. That's like the, the ultimate standard or test. And Deuteronomy talked about this way back in 1400s BC that, you know, if, if this prophet says something and it doesn't happen, hey, you know, he spoke presumptuously, just kind of move on with your life. Um, and, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a pretty good standard, you know, <laughs> if, if somebody says, hey – this is going to happen, and it doesn't happen. It's like, well... Um, but, the, but there is a distinction in the Bible. Sometimes things are prophesied of what will happen, or, or, or so on, um, how God will act or react. But it's not an absolute statement of what will be. It's, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And I think sometimes people kind of overlook that, and so they say, okay, the, well, this didn't happen. And all the while, God said, well... You know, it was dependent on what you did. For instance, uh, if you read the books of the law, it says, "Okay, Israel, if you do this, I will be with you. I will, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, nothing bad's going to happen. I mean, keep keep people from from interrupting you when you when you uh, observe the Sabbath. I'm going to make sure that none of your enemies come against you when you're celebrating your feast. I'm going to make sure that you, you you're all you're on the clear. All these different things. But then he says this: if you don't do that, I'm not going to do that. And the prophets kind of carry over a lot of that too. Like, okay, this is what you're doing. This is what's going to happen. I mean, take for instance uh, the prophet Jonah. You know, he goes to the city and says, uh, "Yet 40 days, and this whole place is going to be destroyed." And then it wasn't destroyed. So was he a liar? No, they repented. And there's always in all the in all the books of the prophets, there's this this just expectation of God is merciful if you repent. Who knows how, how, how much his, how far his mercy will extend? He'll have mercy, but we just don't know what does that going to look like. Or like for instance, in the in the book of Jeremiah, okay, yes, God is merciful, but at the same time, Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, and he made that absolutely clear, and then it was. So um, some prophecies are choices, not guarantees. Um, typically, if you prof if prophecy is written after the fact. So let me kind of clarify what I'm saying here. We looked at this a little bit last time. I guess it was two weeks ago when we were talking about Daniel, about whether a prophecy was written after the fact or, or if it was actually prophetic. So the idea here being that some people think that in the Bible the prophets waited until the event happened and then they, they wrote a prophecy supposedly from God but pretending that it was before. Well, obviously there's the obvious problem that Israel, you know, there'd be no way to get it widespread circulation like any occultic writing. But beside that being aside, um, typically if prophecy is written after the fact, it betrays that, that, that you had that knowledge. You know, it, it kind of like they're, they're talking about something and it's like, okay, that was a little bit too specific. You know what I mean? Uh, there, there's, there's basically two extremes with prophecy. On one side, there's like, for instance, the prophecies of Nostradamus where it – could be any number of things, and it's just too vague to be sure. And then there's the other extreme, where it's a little bit too specific. And then there's the, the place where like the biblical prophets are, which is pretty much in the middle, where things, things are sometimes really clear. Like, for instance, I believe it's the book of Isaiah, where he specifically mentions Cyrus by name. But then a lot of the other things really are just kind of not as clear and uh, so so there's so there's that does that kind of make sense yeah more or less okay uh, let's see then there's then there's a, the same kind of proof that we were looking at when we were looking at, at a lot of the other things in the Bible that the things in the books of the prophets they connect with and and they they can be dated by first off the rulers. They say, okay, I prophesied during these people's reigns. Real people. Real historical events. In fact, I believe it's in the prophet Amos. He talks about, in the year that the earthquake happened, it was after that. And it's like, so okay, we're talking about, it had to have been a pretty big event, because he was able to just say the earthquake, and everybody knows what he's talking about. Second off, uh, 
he never said that the earthquake was caused by God's wrath. Kind of a big deal because you have a lot of Christians nowadays who think that every single thing is directly connected to um, a people's sin, for instance. Which, I mean, not even the Bible takes that view, so it's a little bit hard to uh, go to such extremes. Um, but then they, they tie it in with real, real events, like for instance in Isaiah, where he talks about um, when Hezekiah was our king, and I talked to Hezekiah, then Hezekiah said this, and then this, and this, and then this this ruler came against us from, from Babylon, and this is what happened there. And uh, so we, we have actual like like events. It's not like it doesn't get like so far into the mystical that it's like beyond like reasonable dialogue. The only book in the whole um, prophet book, prophetical book, that goes to the extreme that it's hard because it gets a little bit mystical is the is the prophet Ezekiel. Um, the, pretty much the there's like the first half of it is is like a coded message, <laughs> you know, and then he has then he has some parts that are just um, pretty easy, and then he goes talking about this this temple that's going to be built that we have yet to see that temple be built. And then we have a problem because in Revelation it says that there will be no temple. So it's like, what? So where's this temple going to be? And so Ezekiel is really the only book that that you have to really try a lot harder than the other ones to learn about because if you just read it and don't pay attention, you're going to say, oh, that one's that one's just wrong. And I'm it's less inspired than the other ones. You're just going to write it off. But just because something requires more brain power doesn't mean that it's wrong. <laughs> it just means it requires more brain power. And so because of that, a lot of people have, have recruited the book of Ezekiel to, for instance, argue that uh, UFOs are real. But I guess there will always be things like that that happen. Um, and then, uh, obviously, it connect, they connect with historical events. Absolutely. Uh, the style of writing helps us to date it. Uh, the details of that time follow, just like in, when we were talking about the books of history. Um, all the places where it says it happened at this time, it, there's there's plenty of reason for us to believe that it did happen at that time, and pretty much no reason for us to disbelieve the Bible um, without some kind of reason or proof or something. Um, so what a lot of people have, have – scholars is what they call themselves, but I would debate that on some of these people. That, you know, sometimes people think that just because they have a degree that they're so smart and they you know, can say these outrageous things and it's okay because they're smart. This is someone with a doctorate's degree, so surely everything that they say is right. And if you actually like stop and think about it, it's like, well, that doesn't really make sense. But then they'll, they'll just state it as fact and then they'll write a book. And that's like the ultimate sign of it. it is fact when a, a person with a doctorate's degree writes a book. And so a lot of these scholars have taken this kind of a view that the prophetic books were not written by the prophets themselves, that they were fragments written long after. So basically the idea is this. There was a prophet. Maybe. Maybe there was a prophet. Maybe not. He had disciples who... Once again, maybe we don't really know exactly, kind of stuck in the elusive cloud of mythology. And then throughout the generations, their disciples' disciples wrote a series of fragments, and those fragments were eventually pieced together to make the prophetic book. I mean, just stupid nonsense like that. Um, so uh, were they written from fragments dating long after or as a whole at the time? See, what they do is they say this. Daniel. The book of Daniel couldn't have possibly be written, been written at that time. So instead, we're going to say that it was written in fragments, although there's no proof of there ever being fragments. And then we're going to say that these fragments were stuck together. And because we have taken this view that the book was actually a series of fragments, this fragment date must date to this time over here, and this fragment must date to this time over here. That proves that it was fragments. What? See, you see, you see the reasoning behind this? It just doesn't make, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Anyways, so there's really no no reason to believe this. It's just that a lot of scholars wrote it in books, and so therefore we must believe it because a scholar wrote it in a book. Um, so, but the biblical prophets can be compared to their culture and the practices of their culture. Um, for instance, um, it is uh, it, it's it's a well-known fact that the that the prophets, the secular prophets, would when they had a word. That they would they would they would write it down right then and right there, and that they would even have uh, scholars who, who checked them, and who then they would have the the, the the letter or whatever whatever format 
um, you know, be carried directly to the king, and they would have all kinds of checks in place. And uh, I believe it was an Egyptian prophet who uh, specifically asked for, for, this, for this one scribe to make sure that it was recorded correctly. So then to say, okay, these are the practices of the secular world, and no way could the biblical prophets have been just as careful. Why? Why should we assume that the biblical prophets were not careful to preserve what the words that they got if they truly believed that it was from Yahweh when we know that the secular prophets did? Why should we hold them to a different standard with no proof? See what I mean? Some, some, oh, this is what I'm talking about. People sometimes get so smart that they actually kind of start to get dumb. And anyways, so it says that this was the exact word that, you know, this this is what, what was said. And it's like, so now you're saying that they're incompetent to write down a word or that they are not even doing what the culture is doing? Like, what are you even trying to say by this? So there's really no basis for assuming there was a long delay between the oral presentation, what the prophet said to the king or to whoever, and the written form. There's really no reason to assume that when we have more than ample evidence of, of their practice at the time. But that brings us to a whole other question. Why trust the prophets or the Bible as a whole? Well, sometimes when you're studying, you'll kind of get these ideas like, okay, okay, hold on. So we looked at all this, and it's kind of helpful to, to kind of backtrack and review a few things. Now, I mentioned these before. Let's look at them again. First off, we're talking about eyewitness situations where Moses was actually there, and this is what he said. And then the people who were there with Moses, they actually saw it themselves. Why would these people have gone with Moses and endangered their life if they didn't actually see these things happening in Egypt? You know, we... we if you, if you try and say that the things didn't really happen, you're left with more questions than you have answers. And see, the thing is, is it's like we're trying to do gymnastics to disprove the super, that the supernatural can happen. But here's the thing, you don't actually have to prove or disprove the supernatural happening to believe in the Bible. Because just because somebody attributes something to God doesn't mean that it didn't historically happen. COVID-19 was the wrath of God! Well, does that mean that COVID-19 didn't happen? just because I attributed it to a supernatural event? See, I don't have to disprove or prove the supernatural world. That has nothing to do with it. I can believe the Bible regardless of whether I believe in the supernatural. Even if I'm an atheist, I can believe in the Bible because of, the, of a, I mean, it's historical claims, obviously. So why, uh, why would they bother preserving a book of lies? This is kind of important because this is their entire culture. And remember, Israel went into exile and these books survived the exile. Why would they preserve these books after the exile if God was really their God? Why couldn't he have saved them from the exile? See what I mean? It had to have been so important that it stuck with them, even though they lost everything else. In fact, a large portion of Israel didn't even return back to Israel. After, after Cyrus says, hey, you guys can go home, a lot of them just said, we're fine. We'll just stay here. And yet the books were still preserved. <laughs> That's something that needs to kind of be addressed. Um... The, then the events are historically proven. They, they tie in with things. Obviously, um, we're not saying that there is no problems in understanding them, like dating the kings. That was really a difficult thing. Thank God for Thiel. Um, so these are things that happen for real. Uh, they're well-preserved. They last at the test of time, uh, as very few things do. If you know anything about history, there's very few things that last the test of time. Very few things. Um, and then, obviously, the, the, the things are historical. It, 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 it just fits even in the minor details. When it says that Joseph was sold as a slave for this price, and it just so happens that at that time, that was the going price of the slaves. Like, little details like that. Are you, you're saying that they just made this stuff up hundreds of years later when the, when the little minute details actually fit? That just doesn't make sense. You, you have to have more faith to disbelieve the Bible than to just believe it. It's just, it doesn't make sense. And it makes even less sense if you don't go to the rest of historical knowledge with that same um, skepticism. Like, why not be skeptical about the Egyptian records or the Babylonian records? Or if you're that skeptical about everything, then what qualifies to be worthy of trusting? What, what, what does something have to do before you can believe in it? Because if you reach that level of skepticism, it's like, why should I even believe that President o that Obama was president in 2008? I mean, if we're reaching that level of just stupid skepticism. So a much better question, why believe scholars who march forward on their own assumptions and guesswork with zero evidence? Everybody says, oh, why believe the Bible when, when this? 
Why should I believe the scholars who make these outrageous claims with absolutely no no evidence to back up their claims? Why should I believe someone who ju who's just born into the world 50 years ago instead of a book that's lasted 2,000 plus years? That just doesn't make sense. Many examples of prophets' writings have been uh, have been verified, and once again, we looked at this two weeks ago with Daniel. Just just one thing, one thing in the whole book that we know was written before the event happened. Regardless of what, what view you take for the whole rest of the book, at least that one prophecy was written much before about the war with the, with the kings of the north and the south, and it happened just like that. And then it said that it said that there'd be one that would be born that would end the end the sacrifices. Everybody thinks for some reason that's talking about the Antichrist, but the sacrifices were ended before the Antichrist, so that doesn't really make sense. And then what does it ha so happen? Of course, that Jesus is born and he does away with sacrifices, right in in line with Daniel's prophecy. And you're and you're honestly trying to say that we should be so skeptical. It just doesn't make sense. Okay, so there's a few neat details that I wanted to mention before um, before we close up the old the discussion of the Old Testament, which once again we're not going to close up the discussion this week, but. Um, in in uh, in the ancient Near Eastern world, before people made treaties with with other people, they would usually consult their deity, which this was obviously done because the the, the gods wouldn't actually speak to them. So they do like a series of omens. Like for instance, um, if if the liver looks like this on the animal, it means this. If this happens, it means you know what I mean. Those kinds of things. So consulting the deity by means of sacrifice and ritual, not by means of God actually talking. Um, and so this was a common practice, and yet we read in the book of Joshua that, is, that the Gibeonites disguise themselves as someone else, and they say, hey, let's have a treaty together. And Israel, without even asking God or without you know thinking twice, just, yeah, okay, let's have a treaty. When this is something that even the secular world did. Why would they have done that? And that, see, knowing knowing the little the little details like that helps us to understand. Ah, maybe they were being arrogant. That happens to the best of us. Uh, maybe they just thought that since God told them to do something, they didn't need His help. God told us to conquer Canaan, so let's just go ahead and do it. Either way, they were wrong. Um. Um, going back to the whole thing that I said about uh, fragmentation of documents, another book that they're real big on uh, doing that is the book of uh, Deuteronomy. Oh, they love to do this with book Deuteronomy. Oh, it's 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 different, and uh, so that means you know it's written in pieces here and there. Uh, there's J, document J, document D, document E, document P. Somewhere along the lines, these uh, diff there were different Israelite Yahweh cults. And they took different manuscripts, and then eventually, through the process, these two cults got together. You see what I mean? This whole long, convoluted thing. When, once again, remember, there's no evidence of these J, E, D, and P documents ever existing. So don't forget that. And uh, the thing is, you can make something as complicated as possible, but usually the simple answer is the right one, usually. Not always, but usually. Um, so many many books have been fragmented then assume that they could have only happened later. So Deuteronomy um, is oftentimes dated to around 600 BC instead of around 1400 BC. Um, but the, this kind of this kind of is, is ridiculous because we actually have a lot of examples from a city named Mari, um, uh, Mari uh, that. Um, help us to date Deuteronomy back to when it actually said, and uh, there's just a lot of things that little specifics. Um, the excavation that was done at the city of Mari was actually a, a gold mine for biblical scholars because it helped us to understand a lot of the Old Testament and whatnot. But anyways, so without without even realizing that we have an example from, that predates the book of Deut Deuteronomy, they then say Deuteronomy had to have been written afterwards because it didn't have this this kind of uh, proof in here, which I really don't want to get into because that's a whole long discussion, only happened in 600 BC. And it's like, well, actually, those documents at Mari happened before the book of Deuteronomy was written. So you kind of have a little bit of a problem there. Um, and so then that leads us to a really big example. Ignorance of something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. For instance, if we don't have... Um, 
if we have not discovered a document yet, that doesn't mean that the document doesn't exist. We just don't have access to it yet, right? Um, another example, um, let's say that the document has been uncovered, but it hasn't been translated yet. Well, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And so, or here's another example. Let's say that um, a document has been discovered, but it just hasn't received a whole lot of attention. So as a result, the scholar doesn't really mention it, and even though it disproves their whole theory, which once again is based on zero evidence, well, <laughs> that doesn't mean that that doesn't exist. And so what you have happening a lot of times is you have scholars will just kind of believe what they want to believe, and then if there's something that disproves that, they'll just kind of, no, that's not what that means. Well, what do you mean it's not what I mean? Well, it's, 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 so I mean, they'll just kind of push it to the background. Like, for instance, I mentioned the whole thing about um, Yahweh, the, the people of the land of Yahweh being mentioned right when Israel was just new to the land of Canaan. And yet, how many secular scholars did you hear talking about that? None. Even though it's the earliest reference of Yahweh, and it dates right to when the Bible dates Israel in Canaan, they still completely ignore it. Oh no, because we've already decided that Israel was actually Can was actually just a, a group of Canaanites, and those Yahweh worshippers were Edomites. They they weren't Israelites. How do you know? And it's just nonsense like that. Anyways. And, uh, and then there's another issue that I feel like a lot of scholars don't really emphasize. Uh, if you remember, we were watching that lecture by um, Walton, um, not Walton, uh, Hoffmeyer. It was Hoffmeyer, not, not Walton, it was Hoffmeyer. And he was talking about the way that a lot of scholars will look at modern maps and then they'll, they'll base an idea off of a modern map. And then he said, you can't do that. You have to base it off of what the land looked like back then. Remember that? Do you guys? Okay. So it's it's kind of a very similar thing with with words. Sometimes there'll be modern terms that had a different understanding back then. Just a few examples here. In Egypt, a prophet or prophetess may be a mourner, so somebody who who professionally mourns and and, and uh, for like funerals and stuff. Uh, a priest that's like an upper tier t priest, so basically like, kind of like a high priest, if if you want to use that kind of terminology. Or it could be like a sage, so like a spiritual uh, leader person. Whereas when we hear the word prophet, we think someone who prophesies. See what I mean? So we have a modern word, prophet, that is applied to an old concept that has a wide range of meaning, but because we are somewhat ignorant of ancient culture, we just kind of, oh, well, they had this too. And it's like, well, now hold on. <laughs> Calm your jets. And then obviously the question that I already asked, why did why did the book why did the, the Bible or the prophets why did they make it through the exile? Why why were they preserved that long? Um, so we're gonna go ahead and stop there. Um, I know it seems like this lesson was forever long, but it was actually only 27 minutes long. <laughs> so uh, next week we'll probably finish up looking at the at the prophets. There's just a few more things to look at. Um, uh, we're gonna look a little bit at Ezekiel. Uh, kind of just so you understand that he's not talking about aliens. Um, we're going to look a little bit at Jonah uh, because he says that it took him three days to w walk through the city when it wasn't that big. So it kind of seems like we have a little bit of a historical error. We'll look at that. Um, and there's just a few other little things. And then we'll try and give like a little brief chronology to just kind of show you where all the different books of the Old Testament are fitting in now that you've got kind of a broader picture. So we'll, we'll come back and do that next week.